Sino. I'm Rob Burgess, and I'm Chief Business Officer for Sino Biological. And I would like to officially welcome everyone today to the next installment in the Sino Biological Lock and Key webinar series focused on immunology and immunological reagents and related services. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker today, and he's going to talk to us about methods for generating uh, 3D antibody models, primarily from 2D protein gel electrophoresis data. So it's going to be a very interesting topic for discussion. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I just have really one primary uh, housekeeping item, and that is I'd like to ask everyone to ask their questions if they have any of the speaker in the chat box. And at the completion of the speaker's seminar, we will run through those questions in the chat box and do everything we can to get to and address everyone's question. So again, just type them in there and we'll get to them at the close of the seminar. So with that, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you today, Nels Thornsteinson. Uh, Nels originally obtained his master's in bioinformatics and computational chemistry from the University of British Columbia. And in 2008, he joined Chemical Computing Group as an application scientist. And he is now, in fact, the director of biologics at CCG. He is responsible for performing scientific research and support, as well as programming custom applications at CCG and guiding the company's 3D biologics modeling applications and development. So with that, I will turn it over to Nels. And Nels, thank you for your time today. And we look very forward to your seminar. Thank you very much for the all too kind introduction there. Um, yeah, we are used to that from Sino. We met the folks uh, from Sino at a conference recently in San Diego, antibody engineering. And I have to say they might be the friendliest participants there. So I'm going to share my screen. Appreciate that, Nels, by the way. <laughs> Friendlier than us, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. Too kind. So we can hear me and see the slides. Uh, the slides are not up yet, unfortunately. The slides are not up. OK, mm -hmm. let, me, let me try again. Yeah, now they're up. Okay, this time I did it. All right, so we have a talk titled uh, Structure-Based Charge Calculations for Predicting Properties and Profiling Antibody Therapeutics. This uh, work is mostly data that's been published recently in MABS under this reference here. So we'll go through uh, the data in the publication and a few extras as we try to put things together in terms of the way we see uh, antibody engineering and how 3D modeling can fit into that. Uh, so groups will often have a panel of candidates they'll get from target screening. This could be a number of sequences of antibodies or maybe other proteins that bind to a target. And our job as modelers at uh, CCG and with our software Mo is to take these sequences, produce 3D models, and calculate some relevant properties for them. So we do that uh, with an automated modeling procedure. And from there, with these properties, we want to go and do a developability assessment, try to see which of these candidates are more promising for uh, being easier to store at high concentrations for things like viscosity or, um, you know, large amounts of hydrophobicity can be an issue for solubility and chromatography behavior. There's also some chemical liabilities to think about during long-term storage. We can get modified amino acids like methionines can oxidize or you could have these isomerization events occur. And we'd also like to detect those computationally before moving forward with any, any given candidate. And finally, we can wrap this all together into a drug-like profile for an antibody 
And the focus of this work is really on these two areas right here, the charge calculations and putting things together into profiling. And of course, it's possible to use structures to optimize further for uh, affinity or other things we can do and considerations for formulation. So starting with antibody modeling, this is the method to go from sequence to structure uh, for an antibody. We take the variable domain and do a framework template search. Based on ID, we can find the best matching framework in the PDB and then find the best matching CDRs. For each given CDRs, we'll use the amino acid similarity and we do a class check just to make sure that the template we find isn't clashing with other templates that are already chosen. We get this chimeric template built that all we need to do now is make the remaining mutations. And um, that will be done by repacking the side chains with a side chain packing uh, algorithm. And then finally, we energy minimize this model with uh, the amber force field. So that gives us a variable domain model given a sequence. From there, it's possible to go and model larger parts of the structure if we want the entire fab or the full immunoglobulin tetramer. That's possible as well. Although there's far fewer templates available structurally in the PDB to build these, so the results aren't quite as good as we get for the variable domain. The next slide is a view of the performance of the variable domain modeling. So in order to assess that, what we do is there's, there's about 5,000 structures in the PDB and uh, of, of antibodies. And we take the most recent thousand of them and we remove them from the database. And then we model them from sequence uh, fr from uh, the, the pool of structures that has those removed. And then we measure the RMSD of these models we get to their actual crystal structures. And the RMSDs are in angstroms. So what we normally find is for the framework and the canonical loops, we get around one angstrom, which is more or less a correct prediction. And then for the CDR3 on, on the heavy chain, we get this error where, you know, it can vary to about three angstroms or 2.9 here. Um, that's if we superpose the models onto the frameworks and then measure the RMSDs. Some groups, they'll also superpose the H3 loops directly. And uh, we get about two angstroms when we do that. We investigated whether the grafting scheme we use makes a difference. So we need to graft these templates together. Uh, and to do that, we need to pick a scheme. Well, here we look at the Kabat versus the IMGT scheme for uh, H3 loop definition. We don't find that it makes a difference what we use for grafting these together. We also find that the performance improves over time. So what we described on the last slide was basically the performance up to 2017. And uh, if we remove more of the structures, so remove all the templates from up to 2012, you see the RMSD or the performance gets worse and likewise as we go further back in time. So as more and more structures appear in the PDB, the performance of this tool gets better and better. And you know, you hope more structures keep getting added to it and the performance simply keeps improving. The last thing we investigated here is um, the question of how much does the template quality for the H3 loop impact the performance of the modeling. And basically, if your template is more identical to the sequence for the H3, you get a better performance. You get a lower RMSD. Uh, if the H3 loop happens to be quite long, you actually tend to get deteriorating performance. You get a higher uh, RMSD. So the shorter it is, the easier it is to model. And the better your template, the better the model you'll get. And there's an interesting note here where it even if the sequence itself for the H3 loop is present in the PDB, we can still get the model wrong because they're, they are inherently flexible. So you can get two different structures of the same sequence having, having a different conformation. And that's why when we make these models, we also like to perform sampling. And the sampling, it uh, helps us sort of mitigate the error from the models. So the homology models might um, <clears throat> be one prediction. And what we can do is when we calculate properties, instead of relying just on that one model, we can make a hundred models uh, using conformational sampling with low mode MD in cycles with this protonate 3D program, which will actually titrate the molecule as well. So we go from this one homology model to a pool of a hundred models having different sidechain conformations 
and different protonation states at a range of uh, pH. And when we calculate properties, we average on that entire ensemble rather than just on the one model. And um, we tend to get more robust results when we do that. As an example, looking at the hydrophobicity descriptors, we have the, um, some available methods out there uh, in the literature, like the SAP program, CAMSOL, and these others. In Mo, we are basically the best way to assess hydrophobicity we have is to draw these hydrophobic patches and then sum up their surface areas. And the higher the value, the more hydrophobic. And what we find in these references is that if we mutate the residues that are green here, responsible for these hydrophobic patches on the surface, we get better performance in the developability experiments like hydrophobic interaction chromatography. And there's another reference here where they publish the experimental values for 17 IgG4 antibodies. And uh, what we find is as this value grows, the larger the calculated hydrophobicity, hydrophobic patches, the longer the retention time in the hydrophobic interaction column. And they published the computational experiments from these two methods and the experimental values. Uh, and then when we view our numbers along with those, these are Pearson correlations. You see we're getting comparable performance. So uh, for hydrophobicity, yeah, the more hydrophobic the, the surface, the poorer the developability uh, in general. We've seen this in, an, in a number of cases that are out there. And we do find that um, this idea of sampling can reduce the uh, sensitivity of the predictions. You know, if the confirmation of this tyrosine moves slightly, you can actually have a patch disappear or reappear. So it's good to do the calculation on a collection of confirmations. Now we want to get to the charge calculations and we'll start with PI. So there's been a couple of nice uh, papers published recently where they actually published PI measurements for collections of antibodies. And there is um, a data set here with 22 IgG1 clinical stage therapeutics and their corresponding um, experimental PIs. And what we do is we take our PI calculators and we measure how well they work uh, in comparison to the experimental PIs. And we see the Pearson correlations are quite high, you know, 0 0.9791. Uh, and uh, for the second data set, we have another 17 IgG4 antibodies where they've published the PIs. So basically, this slide shows us the tools we have to predict PI. Uh, whether they're based on the sequence or on, on 3D structures or, or working on these uh, antibody data sets. And some of these are, you know, older methods, uh, simple uh, sequence-based PI calculator. And we're also presenting here a novel method to calculate PI, not just based on sequence, but based on the 3D structure uh, and this titrated ensemble that we have. Since we've created a version of the structure at a range of pH, we could ask that ensemble, well, at what pH does that structure have a net charge of zero according to the modeling and, and the force field? And we get a, a physical prediction of the, of the PI. And that's this comparison here, uh, the ensemble PI. So it's, it's a novel method. It wasn't trained on PI data. It wasn't even really meant to calculate PIs, but it's matching the data nonetheless, which is kind of interesting. But in this case, for antibodies, we don't see it performing much better than um, older methods. Moving on to viscosity, uh, there's a data set published by uh, Pfizer, this, this paper here. They published experimental viscosities of 38 IgG1 antibody variants, and they compared various methods that are out there for um, predicting viscosity. One of them is called SCM, spatial charge map. It quantifies the amount of negative charge patches on the surface of the protein. And as you get more negative, you get more viscous. And they also looked at some other multi-parameter models that are out there. What we did was we modeled these antibodies using the methods described uh, in the previous slides. And we calculate the charge of the variable domain. And we find something similar where if we have a positive charge on the variable domain of the antibody, we prevent severe viscosity. So you're getting more viscous to the, to the left here. Um, 
So somehow for these IgG1 antibodies, if we're neutral or negative on the variable domain, we get a problem with viscosity. There's a similar data set available uh, from MIT. More uh, data on this time is 21 IgG1 clinical stage therapeutic uh, antibodies. They publish viscosities. In this case, you get more severe viscosity towards the right. And um, we find the same thing. If we have this positive charge on the variable domain, we're helping prevent having these severe viscosities that we see on these, these neutral uh, variable domains. For example, although the trend isn't as you know nice like it was with the uh, with the with the first data set, so these IgG1 antibodies are benefiting from having a positive charge on the variable domain, <clears throat> and that's at pH seven. There's also pharmacokinetic clearance, uh, and historically in the literature we see that you know PI hydrophobicity and polyspecificity play a role. Uh, if you bind non-specifically to proteins in, in plasma, that could, you know, expedite the clearance, which can be a bad thing. We want the half lives to be to be longer, of course. And um, recently, this data set has been curated and published with human clearance values for 64 uh, antibody clinical stage therapeutics. Um, and what's nice about that is uh, there's a publication containing developability experiments for each of these, about 12 different types of experiments, you know, chromatography, and this is the polyspecificity reagent binding, and it was the best uh, experiment at predicting the human clearance. And that's if we look at all the experimental measurements and all of the uh, in silico properties that we calculated. And the Correlation was about 0.5 uh, with the, with, for the Pearson coefficient. Um, the best calculated property was the PI with a correlation of about 0.3. So the correlations aren't as high for the clearance. It's more difficult to predict. So we don't really have, uh, we don't just use the descriptors themselves. We start combining them into two, um, you know, multi-parameter models. And here we draw a box using the, the two descriptors and cutoffs where we get an enrichment, you know, more of these, uh, green and blue dots in the box and proportionately, disproportionately uh, high amounts of these red ones outside the box. And the red ones are the ones that clear uh, quite quickly from the, for, the, for the human clearance. We also took an approach, a computational approach from Genentech using the hydrophobic index and the charge to draw a similar box. And we're not quite as successful as they were on their data from uh, monkeys. And we went on and found, if you don't want to perform these experiments or don't have access to it, uh, purely computationally, you can replace the PSR reagent binding assay with this hydrophobic patch descriptor. So as you get more hydrophobic, we will filter those out. You filter out you know, a couple of red ones. And of course, the PI, we have a bit of a sweet spot here where we don't want the negative charge and we don't want it to be too positive. And if you're in this sweet spot, you get this enrichment where you have a 67% accuracy uh, for being able to filter out these poorly behaved, fast clearing antibodies in red. Another thing to note here is the blue colored ones are the very slow clearing antibodies with abnormally long half-lives. They're all in the box or the ones that miss the box are right at the borders. So it's kind of a neat uh, computational prediction for human clearance. And there's one more piece of work here on clearance explaining why we don't want a positive charge too positive is because then if it's too positive, we might get binding to heparin. Uh, so this is the charge of the variable domain relationship with this heparin chromatography data. Uh, and yes, the higher the charge, the more likely you're, you're sticking to heparin, which is a very negatively charged protein. And if you bind to it, you can get increased pedocytotic uptake as the mechanism for clearance. So the next thing was to put this all together and um, into these drug-like parameters. Uh, and there was this really nice work from the University of Oxford where they came up with the TAP rules, as they're called. And these are five descriptors to characterize and profile uh, uh, antibodies. 
and they have a, a hydrophobic patch descriptor. It's called PSH. And in our version, we simply replace that with the hydrophobic patches that we've shown in this talk. Uh, and we, we collapse their, the rest of their, their five rules into, into four rules, basically. So they had three charge rules, the positive charge patches, the negative charge patches, and we didn't see much evidence for why we'd want both of those. And we do have evidence for viscosity and clearance, why we'd want to look at the charge of the variable domain. So we say, hey, let's um, remove the extremes in, in variable domain charge as our, as our charge-based rule. They found that the CDR lengths were interesting. The actual clinical stage therapeutics tended to have shorter CDRs than you know, a series of, of, of human antibody decoys. So we copied that rule as well. We want to avoid these antibodies that have longer CDRs. Um, and the last rule is this charge separation rule where they had used the charge symmetry, FVCSP, the product of the charge of the light chain times the charge of the heavy chain. And we just converted that to the charge of the heavy chain minus the charge of the light chain, giving you a, a difference or a separation rather than a, than a symmetry, just because you can get erratic results from taking a product. Uh, you know, if you have a charge of zero here, neutral, well, anything you multiply zero by gives you a zero. And that's just a bit of a strange behavior. So we went with the distance there. So here's a look at these four drug-like uh, rules for antibodies. Uh, we have the hydrophobicity, the charge, the size, basically, and the charge separation between the light and heavy chain. We have 600 uh, antibodies in this data set. So that's a lot of data. It shows you the distribution of the values and the medians. So we have a, a, you know, you can kind of model your antibody and get this value and see where it measures up against all of these antibodies that have been, you know, to phase one or higher in, uh, in the clinic. And you see this kind of if we plot the ones that are FDA approved here, uh, you can see a, a disproportionate amount of, of non-FDA approved antibodies are very hydrophobic. And that's, that's pronounced here in the tails of the distribution for the charge separation. This was one of the better descriptors at enriching for FDA um, approval. If we cut these off here, we actually filter out a whole bunch of candidates that don't happen to be uh, FDA approved yet. Another interesting thing is we take those 600 antibodies in the clinic and measure the net charges of their variable domains at pH seven, we get a uh, uh, plus four. So they're actually, they're positively charged these things, uh, which is kind of neat. And we see we need the positive charge for, to prevent um, viscosity in IDG one. And another little note here about that is to also think about the Termini, the uh, variable domain contains both N termini of the antibody. And at pH seven, the N terminal amine group is uh, positively charged. So you actually get plus two from that on average in the way we do the calculations. And that's quite interesting. So half of the charge we need to prevent severe viscosity is actually coming from the terminal amine groups that people might not think about. In fact, a lot of charge calculations out there, they, in a way, they just ignore the termini, they assume the N terminus will cancel out with the C terminus, so we don't need to think about it. But with antibodies, that's not quite the case because when you take just a variable domain, the C terminus isn't the real C terminus, it's actually connected to the elbow residues and, and the C1 domains, so you don't have that uh, charge group there. In fact, the charge group is way down at the uh, C terminal end of the FC domain. Uh, so what we do is when we make these models, we put a neutralizing capping group on the termini of the variable domain so that we actually see the charge um, the, correctly on, 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 our, on our models for the, for the positive charge. So taking those 600 antibodies and, and looking at the profiles, we had a few questions. Uh, from reviewers about, well, what impact is there on the isotypes, the subclass, or the germline families of these antibodies? So since we're just modeling the variable domains, there's really no dependence on the isotype, where the differences are really in the constant region. We, for these four descriptors, we get the same values, more or less. There are about 100 lambda antibodies in the clinic, and uh, they tend to have uh, a bit more hydrophobicity 
and longer CDRs. That's because the CDR1 on the Lambda uh, light chain, it's, uh, it has three extra residues typically. Uh, so just expect that if you're working with Lambda antibodies. And for each one, we also identified the nearest germline family. Here we just show the heavy chains. Uh, so we had 600 examples, you know, 9% of the time we had this germline. These are the, the three most popular, you know, 10% and 10%. Um, we didn't find much difference in the numbers we get, depending on which germline class was, was used. Although we did find for this popular germline, there was maybe somehow leading to some, some more hydrophobic. Uh, those, those 57 antibodies were a little more hydrophobic. Um, than uh, than the others, but not much uh, discovered there about the um, isotype germline and subclass. And finally, bringing things into context a little bit more, uh, we talked about the IgG1 viscosity. We need a positive charge on the variable domain, and here we look at the full model of the of the tetramer. And we've colored it by charge. So you have blue for positive, red for negative, and white where it's neutral in charge. And a little table here for IgG1 saying, well, the constant region is positively charged, plus four, that's a pH seven, um, where most of that charge is coming from the C1 domains, these, these here. Uh, and if you're going to pack this in at high concentration, it's good to have a positive charge because the, the like charge repels itself at high concentration and you prevent viscosity. But once you have a, a, a neutral FV or a negatively charged FV, you now uh, can interact or the, the molecule wants to order itself um, uh, interacting with this positive charge C1 domain. And that in a way explains a little bit um, why we need a, a positive charge here. And the story might be completely different for IgG two and four. So the data sets that are available publicly are dominated by the IgG one isotype. So I guess a note is be careful if you're working with these isotypes because some of the data we have might not be overly relevant. Um, in fact, the, Ig, the, the constant regions of IgG2 and IgG4 are negatively charged. It's, it's the opposite they have. Um, so, you know, if your screening gives you a negatively charged variable domain, it might be an idea to try one of these scaffolds as, as the isotype. Um, and there's been an interesting work here where they had a well-behaved IgG1 antibody in terms of viscosity and, an, and a well-behaved IgG4 that had a neutral um, variable domain. And when they take the positively charged variable domain from IgG1 and graft it, creating a bispecific antibody on IgG4, uh, they get severe viscosity in this case. So it, it kind of confirms, we don't have much data on these things. This is just one, you know, anecdote, but it, it sort of confirms the theory a little bit. And one interesting thing they noted is that, um, this isn't the end of the world if it has high viscosity because that's at pH seven. So in formulation, they can lower the pH and uh, still have okay viscosity at high concentrations because when we lower the pH, we have more protons in the environment and this negatively charged FC domain of IgG4 gets neutralized by the protons at, at, at a lower pH. And then you don't have this, this dipole interaction effect that we're worried about at a lower pH. But maybe uh, to save the formulation group a bit of uh, a headache and things, we could keep in mind the therapeutic profiles, especially for IgG1 uh, scaffold antibodies. And uh, if your candidate lies well within the distributions, there should probably be less optimization and formulation tricks required for development. We hope in general, well, of course, there's exceptions to every rule. Uh, so in summary, we've demonstrated that uh, we're getting adequate models for the variable domains. Uh, good PI predictions using old methods and new methods for, for antibodies. Uh, the viscosity, we get an okay prediction for IgG1, just using the charge of the variable domain. Don't need those complex multi-parameter models that you might read about for IgG1. Uh, for clearance, it's more difficult. We're getting lower correlations, but have an interesting uh, model with the PSR assay and also these computational 
uh, descriptors, height of verbicity and charge. And finally, yes, we put that together and have these profiling rules that are able to provide an enrichment for FDA approval. If, if your candidate does not pass uh, one of these rules, um, it's in the data set, it's about half as likely to lie in the FDA approved uh, subset. And some acknowledgements, folks at CCG, uh, for working on uh, our software I haven't talked too much about. It's, it's called Mo, and uh, it's a general molecular modeling package. Our, our company and, and, and colleagues have been working on it for a long time, and especially uh, these four for working on the biologics and antibody modeling applications and several discussions leading to all this data going into this publication. The folks at Serono for putting together that human antibody clearance data set and the University of Oxford uh, putting together those great databases for uh, the clinical stage therapeutics and answering several questions and having discussions about that. So thanks everybody for listening. I hope there's time for, uh, and that there are a couple of questions we're about to find out. Yeah, thank you, Nels. That's a wonderful seminar. We appreciate it. Very cutting edge technology out there for antibody prediction. And it's really fascinating that you're able to discern unique properties for approved, I guess, versus unapproved antibodies for therapeutic applications. It's really, really interesting. We got a few good questions here, so I'm going to dive right into them, starting with a Gary Davis. And I'm just, instead of trying to paraphrase, I'm just going to read it directly to make it simpler. Gary asked, if you compare an antibody structure values when produced in one expression platform versus another, say, for example, yeast versus human versus CHO cells, do you see much of a change due to the differences in post-translational modifications between the systems? Well, I, I, I believe there are going to be uh, different PTM patterns and maybe even glycosylation uh, using the different expression systems, although that's not something we can predict. We get, we get a sequence of, a, of an antibody and we're making, um, we're making a, a model that's sort of irrespective of expression system. We're copying the, for the FC domains, we have these glycans that are attached and we copy those from the structures that are available in the PDB, which, you know, we, I don't even think we looked at the expression system in the, in the PDB file. So the, these, these glycans are just sort of being copied over. So yeah, I think that's an area, you know, maybe like a future work area. And uh, it's something we're interested in doing because we make our software flexible. So if we do know that we're using a certain expression system that will have modified amino acids or, or typical glycans and things, we can actually model those atoms specifically so that the numbers and models we get do reflect the expression system. But no, to answer the question, uh, I haven't seen... Uh, we're not able to, to, we don't, we only see what we tell the model to have. So you'd have to read the literature about what the molecules look like coming out of the expression system and then tell our software to model them that way, as opposed to asking our software, what are they going to look like in this expression system? Right. And your software is limited to the knowledge at hand. And I guess you can look at some glycan modifications and glycosylation states based upon what's predicted, but for the most part, um, other post-translational modifications like phosphorylation, for example, wouldn't you wouldn't be able to factor that into your predictions, is that right? Well, we can, yeah, like you said, we, we, we can change the glycan and then we'll get updated models and values of, mm -hmm. of charges and whatnot. Uh, if the protein is phosphorylated, we, we could simply add the phosphate group to the right place and you would see it in the model and in the numbers you you get, usually you get a, a, a different charge now um, from, from having that negatively charged group. So uh, yeah, it will be reflected, but you will be, you will need to be diligent and actually make the model that way. We won't, we do have some programs to try and predict the, the deamidation sites. So if we say, oh, this is a very highly likely deamidation site, then we could actually modify the, you know, aspartate or asparagine residue and have it reflect this new state based on a prediction. This would be a very 
elaborate thing to do, but it's 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 very easy to make the modification. The question, the problem is, we don't know where to make it always. So we, we have these prediction programs to try to tell you, okay, it's it's likely here and it's likely there. Um, but yeah, it would be pretty cutting edge and major undertaking to um, predict these sites reliably and then modify them and really have the 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 models and the numbers we get reflect this stuff in a very kind of robust way. Uh, quick question here from uh, Jiri Wong, if I pronounced that correctly, I apologize if I didn't. Can you also predict other types of proteins other than just antibodies? We we can, yeah, we can model uh, any protein. the 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 better the the template is in uh, in in the PDB, the the better the model will get, and and typically the most the more reliable our structural predictions will be. And, um, and now we have all these structures produced by alpha fold as well. So even proteins that don't have, that aren't crystallizable or don't have crystal structures, a lot of them, we do now have a reliable model that we can use to, um, base a homology model here on in a reliable template, basically. So yeah, it's gotten easier to model just about any protein and get an interesting prediction, um, you know, maybe the issues is you have less data out there to, you know, if you model your protein and what's nice about antibodies, we have so much data, we actually can tell you where your antibody fits within all the rest that have been published in the data. Uh, and that's what this talk is mostly about with other proteins. You don't have that advantage. You, we just, you're sort of modeling it for the first time. So mm -hmm. you'll need to generate your own data in-house and sort of say, and then you start to discover uh, which, modeled attributes are correlating to the experiments that you have and then you can start building you know a, a knowledge base and and get more and more out of the modeling as you do your your research mm -hmm. great and scott mcclennan asked is psr a model or experimental value yeah that's the that's an experimental value mm -hmm. uh from it's the poly specificity reagent binding assay this this here so uh i don't have the reference here there's a pnas paper published by adamab they published experiments for over 100 clinical stage antibody therapeutics and then in this paper they took a subset of those so we have the experimental data and they curated human clearance data for those as well so we now also have human clearance data for those so yes, the best descriptor for predicting clearance, it's not even a descriptor, it's an experiment. Of all the experiments and all the descriptors, the best one was the polyspecificity reagent uh, assay, as you'll find if you if you um, read this, this uh, publication. Great, thanks Scott, for that good question. John Hunger Hyde also asked about the effect of post-translational modifications. I think you answered that very thoroughly so we probably won't delve into that, but thanks, John, for that good question as well. And Gary Davis has another question here. I'll just read it verbatim. When an antibody is converted to an ADC therapeutic, does the structure change appreciably to the extent that its properties change? And if so, can this be predicted? That's another good question. Um, when we, when we have ADCs, there's different ways to produce them. Um, you know, these linkers and payloads are being added, uh, throughout the structure. They look kind of like these glycans. You'll just get a linker and payload added. And sometimes there's a mixture. You get it added in one conjugation site or sometimes four or even eight. Uh, so there's, you get, you know, the, the therapeutic exists as a mixture, uh, uh and it's difficult to sort of say, oh, this is what the therapeutic looks like and it's and 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 this is what the structure is because there's actually eight versions of it depending on which residues get conjugated uh so we can make we can build the models uh but once you're doing this we call this full antibody modeling um things get messy the templates uh are, are mostly a guess so uh and then we're adding a, a we're guessing what the linker and the payload looks like based on a guess of what the whole tetramer looks like. So it's more of a pretty picture than it is uh, something that's, you know, really going to predict the confirmation. I, I'd say, no, we can't predict the confirmation of what an ADC 
looks like. Um, but we can make a model of what an ADC looks like, and it might help explain something that you're noticing. Maybe the, the, the you know, at a certain site, it doesn't work. And then maybe you find this charged residue nearby and you say to yourself, oh, it must be because this lysine is interacting with, with, a, with a negative charge on the, on the cytotoxic portion of the drug. So therefore, hey, maybe if we mutate this lysine, it, it's, it's a bit of a Hail Mary, but it might work if, if we do that. So you can maybe do that sort of thing um, with ADCs, but, uh, you know, nothing robust people do it, but it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's diminishing returns. Uh, we're making it easier for people to do it. So if someone wants to work with us on that, uh, we can, and you might discover something, but it's, it's not sort of day-to-day -day work for most people that, that do this type of modeling, but it's certainly possible if, if you'd like to commit time and maybe, uh, postdoc to uh, running some simulations and things on, on larger molecules. Thanks for that. Xavier Arias had asked a similar question regarding the lysine res residue and ADC purpose. So I think that's been addressed. Uh, Jiri Wang, again, I apologize if I mispronounced the first name, is asking a business related question. This is kind of my area, and that is do you provide the prediction? service or is there a software that others can utilize and really like what's your model for for um, maximizing the value of your technology uh, and that of the ccg we uh we're, we're a software company we we provide uh, software licenses and and only software licenses so we don't have a, a services division uh, and, and we don't do our own, you know, pharmaceutical research producing IP or, or anything like that. But we are very active with our uh, collaborations and collaborative support uh, of the software. So our philosophy is if we make the software easy to learn and easy to use, then the scientists who are actually working on these molecules and know far more about these molecules than, than we do, they'll do a better job overall at, you know, the way that the modeling is intertwined with the experiments in these iterations. We can't get too involved in all of that, but we'll certainly do everything we can to help you make these models with the software. And, and yeah, the, the, the model is we rely on the scientists to learn how to use the software. And so we make it easy for them to learn and we have training programs. And of course, if you're doing something more advanced like ADC modeling, that's where, we would come in and, and, and help as part of our, our collaborative su uh, services to support the, the software. Great. And if somebody were interested in a software license, could they come to you and discuss it or is there some yeah. contact? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. They could, they could email uh, me or, or go to our, our website, uh, chemcomp.com. I think there's those emails there like info at chemcomp.com or sales and the email there uh, or fill out the, the, the free trial form. You, we could actually evaluate the software free of cost for a little while and uh, just try it out and see what you think um, with, with no commitment to, to, to purchase. And um, then we take it from there. Great. Thank you for that. Just a couple more interesting technical questions here because we have time, I think. Karen Paco asks, do you include loops at CDHR3 on the conformational models and how to mitigate error at loop regions that can also promote binding? Right. That's yeah, something I skipped over that a little bit. In our, our default protocol, we do um, allow the H3 loop to move. So I did, I did skip this section. So it's producing alternate uh, sidechain conformations. We produce 100 conformational samples. The sidechains are completely free to move. The backbones in the core of the variable domain and, and then you know, the secondary structure, like the strand portions, they're, they don't move very much. They're restrained to about a quarter of an angstrom. But the canonical loops uh, can move an angstrom on the backbone. The H3 loop can move two angstroms on the backbone. So it's sort of designed to mitigate the average error we get in the models that we showed in our, in our modeling validation. Uh, so yeah, we're saying we don't know what the H3 loop looks like. We, we know that we're about two or three angstroms off when we predict it. 
on average. So let's move it. Let's shake it around two or three angstrom, take a hundred versions of it. And then when we calculate properties and everything, average it on all of those. So that's, uh, that's how we handle that by, uh, by default. Does that answer the question? And it sounded like a great answer to me. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was good. And, um, just one more. I think. Oh, there was a there was a follow up there. Yeah, how does it affect the binding? So, oh yeah. In, in this case, we're not we don't have the antigen bound. In this, for what we show for developability, we don't need the target bound. We're just modeling the antibody, shaking it around to average our guess and calculating properties of the antibody. The antigen is out of the picture. Yes, of course, if you had the antigen there, you know you often can't just move the H three loop three angstroms. It's 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 restricted where the antigen is. So things are a bit different when you have the co-crystal complex, but we can work with those as well. But it's usually, um, when we have that, we're trying to optimize affinity. Um, so that's another avenue to go down. Great. And another technical question. You're getting lots of compliments here in the chat box, by the way, for your wonderful seminar. Okay, well, <laughs> thanks. I'm sifting through those and finding the questions. I think you might have mentioned this, but I'm not sure. Have you ever used your software tools to to predict, um, I guess, the confirmations and performance of single chain antibodies? We have. Uh, there's not very many in this uh, database. Mm -hmm. So there's this um, Therasabdab, the therapeutic antibody database at um, University of Oxford. There's only a handful of single chain antibodies in there. I think there's 10 or less. Um, of course, they were removed from this, this data set is, mo is, is monoclonals. We're, we're trying to, you know, remove the nanobodies and whatnot. Um, we do have that in a separate database. So of course you have different numbers, um, different distributions for the single chain uh, antibodies. So uh, yeah, things are a little bit different. Uh, we can't make use of all this data. And of course, all that viscosity and clearance data, none of it's with single chain antibodies. So we now have to throw that out the window, but yeah, we can sort of think, hey, what if instead of having a fab here, I just had a little single um, VHH domain here. We do the same thing. We would you know, model it, calculate its properties, make sure it's not too hydrophobic. You often get hydrophobicity where it wants to dimerize with the light chain in, in human antibodies. So we have to mutate that. And you can see what it looks like on the full molecule. Hey, maybe if the theory holds, we can prevent problems if we, if we do these things also with uh, VHHs. Great. Great. Thanks for that. And on that note, I think we'll wrap it up. If there are any other questions, y'all can reach out directly to Nels or even reach out to Sino and we'll forward those questions. So we had a wonderful turnout today. I want to thank all of the attendees from around the world for joining us. And, you know, I just want to thank y'all for the excellent questions as, as well. It made for a great discussion. And I want to thank our speaker, Nels Thornstenson. Thank you so much. It was extremely interesting work and congrats to you and to CCG on all your success. It's uh, very exciting what you guys are pursuing. And with that, I just also want to thank my colleague, Christine Lee at Sinobiological for setting up this lock and key webinar seminar today. I uh, went over very well, so thank you, Christine. And again, any other questions, reach out to us at Sino or to Nels directly. And I wish everybody a good afternoon or good evening. So thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, everybody. Bye.